Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. At 2.40 a.m. on Sunday, December 9, 2001, 58-year-old Michael Peterson called 911. According to Michael, his wife, 48-year-old Kathleen Peterson, had a terrible accident. She'd fallen down the stairs. Less than 10 minutes later, first responders arrived and declared Kathleen dead. Then the police arrived, and they were immediately suspicious. There was just too much blood. It didn't look like a fall. In my last episode, The Never-Ending Staircase Part 1, I covered the background of Michael and Kathleen Peterson and their uniquely blended family. If you haven't listened to part one, stop, go listen. It's important to understand Michael's history of deceit, the Durham Police Department's dislike of Michael's outspoken journalism, and the complex inner workings of the Peterson family. Also, in my last episode, I introduced you to the general scene of Kathleen's death. We surveyed the area from a bird's eye view, so to speak. Broad strokes, if you will. Kathleen's body was splayed at the foot of the staircase. Michael sobbed in anguish. And her blood, her blood was everywhere. Now I'll take you through the Peterson household step by step on the night of December 9th, 2001. You will experience the scene just as the emergency responders, law enforcement officials, and others did. This isn't broad strokes anymore. We're getting into the minutia, because this is a case where the devil is truly in the details. Welcome to episode 174, The Never-Ending Staircase, part two. At 2.48 a.m., two paramedics arrived at the Peterson mansion. The paramedics spotted blood droplets on the walkway leading into the house and smeared blood on the front door, which was open. Already, these microscopic details would cause chaos in the courtroom later. If Michael had truly found Kathleen unconscious at the bottom of the stairs and immediately called 911, then why were there blood stains on the walkway and the front door? Had Michael opened the door to help the emergency responders get there faster? Or had he been frantically trying to cover up the brutal killing of his wife? This case is full of moments like these, where one loose string can be pulled and pulled until an entirely different yarn comes to light. As the paramedics entered the Peterson's foyer, they saw a large spiral staircase leading to the second floor. But this was not the staircase where Kathleen was located. The paramedics turned left from the main entryway. They entered the hallway that led to the kitchen. Before they arrived at the kitchen, they stopped at a white-trimmed doorway. This doorway led to an enclosed stairwell and wooden steps. The walls of the stairwell were painted a neutral tan color. On the bottom wall of the stairwell, I guess looking up, there was a framed poster, an 18 by 24 inch vertical print with French text and the silhouette of a large black cat. It was a copy of artist Theophile Steinlin's 1896 poster. He created it to advertise a popular Parisian cabaret's upcoming tour. The cabaret group was called Le Chat Noir, or in English, The Black Cat. Believe it or not, that detail about the poster will come up in court. As the paramedics looked into the stairwell, they saw the Black Cat poster to their left. They also saw that only a few steps up the stairwell, the stairs turned sharply to the right. This allowed the staircase to run parallel to the hallway. But all of this would be secondary in the paramedics' minds because, at the bottom of the stairwell, was the unmoving body of Kathleen Peterson. Her legs were spread out in the hallway. Her head was barely inside the doorframe, near the stairs' first steps. She was wearing a navy sweatshirt, white sweatpants, comfy house clothes. She was barefoot, and the soles of her feet were bloody and her flip-flops were on the floor nearby. Michael was next to Kathleen, trying to help her. He had a dazed stare and was audibly crying. Before the paramedics arrived, Michael surrounded his wife's body with towels and paper towels, and his socks and shoes were also on the floor. Later, one of the paramedics would say that Michael was obviously very, very upset. 
They recalled that Michael had blood on his tennis shoes and clothes. Later, it will become unclear how much blood Michael had on his clothes or where. The paramedics checked for Kathleen's heartbeat, but there was none. Kathleen was gone. Soon after the paramedics arrived, a fire engine crew entered the Peterson household. If you're not familiar, that's standard procedure. Firefighters are trained as paramedics too. Most cities have a system where firefighters respond to medical emergencies, even when there is no fire involved. It's a fail-safe to make sure there is enough trained personnel available. Right away, the fire captain noticed something odd about Kathleen's body. The bottom of her feet were bloody, as if Kathleen had been standing in the blood. That didn't match the captain's mental picture of a person falling down the stairs. If Kathleen had slipped, landed poorly, and died, then why would she have blood on the bottom of her feet? And it wasn't just Kathleen's feet that were covered in blood. There was also blood on the waist of her sweatpants, soaked in blood, like she had bled directly onto the pants, not transferred blood. Blood was literally everywhere, on the floor, in the staircase, even the walls. The blood on the walls of the enclosed staircase appeared to be smeared. Later, the emergency responders would testify that much of the blood appeared dry. Right away, the paramedics were confused, suspicious. What had really happened to Kathleen Peterson? Was this truly the most horrific fall down a few steps that they had ever seen? Or was this something more nefarious? Could this all be an elaborate ruse staged by Kathleen's own husband, Michael Peterson? Playing it safe, the first responders called the police to come and investigate. Later in court, the very clues that made the first responders suspicious would be given reasonable explanations. For example, the blood on Kathleen's feet. If she fell multiple times, it would make sense that she had blood on the soles of her feet. As if she slipped once, her flip-flops coming off, then bled profusely, started to get up, pushed herself to her feet, and slipped again, this time in her own slick blood. And the blood on the waist of Kathleen's sweatpants, that would be consistent with Kathleen sitting up between falls. She was bleeding from the head as she sat up, and it ran down the front of her body, trying to catch her bearing, but continuously failing as she fell over and over again. There were corresponding smears on the doorframe, as if she had tried to pull herself up with her hands. It also explains the blood smears on the walls if she was struggling to get herself up in that narrow corner, now slick with blood. And according to appeals documents, when the emergency workers moved Kathleen's body, her clothes were saturated with blood, positively dripping, not dry at all. Plus, as I mentioned in the last episode, not a single one of the paramedics' reports nor police reports mentioned the supposedly dry blood. It wasn't until court testimony that this crucial detail was revealed. But that will all come later. For now, the paramedics exchanged sidelong glances and meaningful whispers in the Peterson mansion. The local police were on their way, and Michael's son Todd arrived at the house. He was the first non-emergency worker to get there. Todd told the makers of the docuseries The Staircase, quote, It was such a shock when I drove into the driveway to see an ambulance and just think, oh my God. At first, Todd thought his father had a heart attack. After all, Michael was about 10 years older than Kathleen. Todd naturally assumed that Michael was more at risk for a medical emergency. Upon seeing that his father was fine, Todd felt relieved. But when Michael urgently motioned to the staircase, Todd realized that Kathleen was in trouble. According to Michael's interviews, he vividly remembered finding Kathleen, calling 911, and seeing Todd. Todd hugged his father so closely that Michael thought his son was trying to contain him. And he probably was. Todd realized right away his father was pretty much hysterical and that the paramedics were not happy about that. He would soon find the police were not sympathetic either. Then the police arrived at about 3.09 a.m. The lead investigator was Art Holland, Jr. After looking at the staircase and Kathleen, the law enforcement officers quickly determined that they had a crime scene on their hands. Their working theory was vague, but they knew one thing. 
Kathleen Peterson hadn't fallen down the last few steps of stairs. Rather, Michael had killed her. They weren't sure how, but they knew the proof was somewhere in this house. But, as they began investigating, they struggled to keep the Petersons' massive 10,000-square-foot house secure. A parade of people, including both civilians and emergency workers, traipsed through the home. Michael, Todd, and others wandered freely. They touched things, moved them. To be fair, these civilians were friends and family who thought this was an accident, not a crime scene. Even with the police presence, they didn't think it was a murder, and no one was officially cordoning them off from the scene. For example, in the blood next to Kathleen's body, there was a wireless phone, just laying there. Unaware of police procedure, Todd picked it up. Presumably, he put the phone somewhere else. The absence of the phone left behind a phone-shaped outline in a pool of Kathleen's blood. Here's another instance of evidence contamination. After the police showed up, Michael began to wash his hands in a sink in the kitchen. This didn't appear to be a Lady Macbeth-style, out-damned spot situation. Michael wasn't being sneaky, and honestly, he could have been. He could have washed his hands before the cops even got there. He could have gone to the bathroom under the pretense of using the toilet just to hide his hand-washing from prying eyes. But he didn't. In fact, Michael was in clear view of the police officers as he scrubbed his bloody fingers. And, when they asked him to stop, he did. Regardless, it was too late. His hands had been washed. If anything important was to be found on them, it was irrelevant now. And there was more. Not long after paramedics arrived, a friend of Todd's showed up. Then, more worried neighbors and friends entered the Petersons' home. Of course, these concerned people meant well. But in hindsight, they shouldn't have been there. We will never know the full extent of how much evidence was tainted during these critical hours. The police couldn't manage the house or the people inside, and they knew it. According to court documents, at least one officer realized within minutes that there were nowhere near enough officers at the house to control the crime scene. Michael was walking back and forth nonstop as if he didn't know what to do. He appeared confused. At the police officer's instruction, Michael and Todd went outside. The father and son waited on a patio that was adjoined to the kitchen. There, Michael wept and paced some more. Todd was then allowed to go into the kitchen to get a drink and a glass. This action drew the investigator's attention to a blood-stained Diet Coke can. It was on the patio table near Michael and Todd. DNA analysis later identified that the blood on the soda can did belong to Kathleen. Michael's DNA was also found on the beverage, along with strands of Kathleen's hair. Durham County Medical Examiner Dr. Kenneth Snell later stated in court that this made sense. He believed that Michael would have strands of Kathleen's hair on his hands since he was recently holding her head. The strands were then transferred to the Diet Coke can as Michael drank out of it. In the kitchen, law enforcement also discovered blood spatters on the cabinets containing the drinking glasses. It looked like Michael had grabbed a Diet Coke can and maybe thought about getting a glass but changed his mind. And this had to be before they saw him washing his hands. See what I mean about the contamination? It makes all the sequences of events so confusing. According to court documents, a Durham forensic evidence technician named Dan George arrived at the house at 3.07 a.m. At this time, Michael was on the patio. When Dan George was leaving the area, he saw Michael come through the kitchen. Michael passed by an officer who did not stop him from proceeding onward. The officer almost certainly noticed Michael because George reported that Michael was moaning and groaning. Still, Michael was allowed to approach Kathleen's body. He was able to put his arms around her. He pretty much threw himself on her body as everyone stood around and watched. Todd saw this encounter and he was the only one to intervene. He ran over to his dad. He tried to convince Michael to release Kathleen, but Michael wouldn't listen. He would not let go. Finally, Todd was forced to physically lift Michael away from Kathleen's body. All the shifting of Kathleen's body revealed wet blood underneath her, and Dan George noticed that her clothing was still wet with blood. 
Dan George's account of this wet blood directly opposed the first responders' later testimony that it was dry. It also creates a problem a certain blood spatter expert, Durham's own little Dexter, would later have explaining the blood on the shorts Michael was wearing. I never understood why so much was made of this supposed evidence when several cops, medics, and crime scene technicians literally watched Michael do this. If the blood was still dripping when Kathleen's body was moved, it stands to reason it would splash or otherwise transfer to Michael's shorts. And the medics who moved Kathleen's body into a body bag would later say that the blood was indeed still dripping from her clothes. But let's just take a moment to acknowledge that moving Kathleen's body should not have happened. Michael should have been supervised. Someone should have been watching the body. Something. This was not good police work. After Michael was forcibly removed from Kathleen, he sat on a couch near the kitchen. Since he had just touched Kathleen's bloody body, Michael transferred blood onto the couch. Again, this was showing that at least some of Kathleen's blood was wet, not dry. Remember, wet blood supported Michael's version of events. An accident had happened only a few minutes before his 911 call. Dry blood supported an alternate, more malevolent version of events where Kathleen had lain dead for hours, or at least since her phone call with her Nortel colleague just after 11 p.m. Next, the police moved Michael and Todd to a third location, the den. Inside the den was Michael's desk and computer. Police officer McCallop remained in the room with Michael and Todd. His job was to prevent the father and son from talking to each other. Michael and Todd recalled that these moments made it clear to them that this was a crime scene. Todd was characterized as argumentative and even combative later by law enforcement. But think, if he walked in and believed his stepmother had a terrible accident and his father was in shock and the police were treating him as a suspect, he would be angry at their treatment. I can't fault him for that. According to Michael, everywhere he went, a policeman was always there. They were with him constantly. In the den, Michael got on his computer. Officer McCallop said Michael checked his emails and surfed the web. After a time, McCallop was relieved from keeping an eye on Michael and Todd. Up next was Officer Hester. Hester testified that Michael was visibly upset as he wrote on a pad of paper. At different times, Michael would moan, cry, and hold his hands to his head. Michael walked around often, trying to compose himself. Under Hester's watch, he was asked to change out of his clothes so they could be collected for evidence. When Michael was done, Hester notified his commanding officers that Michael's clothes were ready. Officer Hester didn't bag them as evidence, though, and I guess because they were wet, he set them on a windowsill in the den. Since the clothes were important evidence, Officer Hester wanted someone to come collect them. But the clothes sat on the windowsill for four to five hours. At 7.40 a.m., the Durham County Medical Examiner, Dr. Kenneth Snell, stepped into the crime scene. By the time he arrived, the towels under Kathleen's head had been removed and discarded on the floor. Her sweatpants were still dripping with blood. That's five hours after Michael's 911 call, and Kathleen's clothes were still dripping. I just think this is so important, especially when there will be such argument over dried blood and the blood on Michael's clothes. Dr. Snell noted three to four visible injuries on Kathleen's body, but he couldn't do a full examination. That would require moving the body, and Dr. Snell was worried that if he handled Kathleen's body too much, the injuries would worsen. He felt the tears on her scalp would open more. Sometime during Dr. Snell's visit, the local police officers shared their suspicions with Dr. Snell. They didn't believe that Kathleen fell down the stairs. In fact, the police officers were quite certain that Michael had somehow beaten his wife to death. So, as he wrote his original report, Dr. Snell knew of the police officers' concerns. And yet, Dr. Snell's original report stated, it appears that she hit her head on the steps above the corner and then hit the floor in the corner of the stairs. Blood spatter appears to support the scenario. Dr. Snell noticed multiple lacerations or cuts on Kathleen's head. Before he left the Peterson home, he told the officers that it appeared to be a fall, but they should look for an instrument that may have caused the lacerations. It's important to note a few things here. 
At no point did Dr. Snell say weapon. He only indicated that something, an instrument, might have caused the damage to Kathleen's skull. The stairs banister could have been an instrument, or a piece of wood sticking out of the wall. Also something that is rarely mentioned is that there was an old chair lift in the stairwell. It was long out of use, but the Petersons had never had it removed. It was folded up, but definitely still in place, and depending on where Kathleen fell, she could have hit part of the lift. It is difficult to see it in photos. In one, I saw it as right above the 16th step as this diagram labeled it, which sounds high up to me, but it's actually right above the corner turn inside the staircase, so like the third or fourth step if you're counting from the bottom. The stair lift is parallel to the staircase, so it's on the first step going straight up. Sorry if I have confused you. I'll try to find a good photo to post, but at any rate, the stair lift was close to the bottom of the staircase where Kathleen would have fallen. Due to the unusual nature of Kathleen's death, as well as the officer's continued suspicion of Michael, Dr. Snell went ahead and authorized an autopsy. And following Dr. Snell's examination, Kathleen's body was removed from the scene. Kathleen's autopsy was conducted a few hours later at noon on Sunday, December 9th. Medical examiner Dr. Snell, who had just observed her body at the scene, was present for the autopsy. However, he didn't perform the autopsy. Dr. Deborah Radish did that. This autopsy, like everything else in the case, comes under much debate. To begin, it was recorded that Kathleen was 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighed 120 pounds. Her hair was dark brown and her eyes were gray-green. At this time, her body had not yet gone through rigor mortis. We'll now go through each of Kathleen's injuries. First, Kathleen was diagnosed with multiple lacerations and avulsions to the posterior scalp. In short, she had cuts on the back of her head. The pictures of these lacerations leave a lasting impression. They are large, deep cuts. It looks like her skull is bursting open. I hate to be gross, but think of it like the skin of a peach, pulling away. These lacerations, along with the photographs of the bloody stairwell, are probably the most compelling pieces of evidence against Michael. From a layman's perspective, it is difficult to understand how Kathleen could have been injured this severely from a fall. Next on the autopsy was Kathleen's multiple contusions to the posterior scalp meaning she had bruises on the back of her head. This is something I haven't heard in many places, I think because it's confusing. It's bruises on the skin, on the scalp, not bruising on the brain, which we are getting to, or even on the skull, because there is such a thing as bone bruises. Think of banging your elbow on something sharp. There is a cut, and around that cut is a bruise. Now, you didn't break your arm, but it is still bruised. Does that make sense? Then there was Kathleen's slight to moderate subarachnoid hemorrhage. Essentially, there was bleeding in the space between her brain and her skull. But, and this is important, Kathleen's brain was not injured. It was not bruised. This hemorrhage was probably from the lacerations. As Dr. Radish put it in the notes, she found no contusions or abnormalities. Remember, I used the word bruise a moment ago. Well, a contusion is a medical term for a bruise. We hear it all the time on our favorite crime shows because it sounds fancier or more sinister than a bruise. Or the fake medical examiner on the TV can say, see all the contusions and bruising on the victims, blah, blah. It's just to add extra words usually. You won't see both in a medical report. They are the same thing. Please Google this if you don't believe me. Any way you ask the question, you get the same answer. A contusion is the same thing as a bruise. Although, of course, there are different types and varying degrees of seriousness for contusions or bruises. I think bruises is something you hear a doctor say to you instead of contusions, which is more formal and scary sounding. But again, there were no contusions or bruises, if you prefer that word, on Kathleen's brain. 
not small ones, not insignificant ones, none. They were only on her scalp, surface level. Also important, the autopsy did not reveal any skull or neck fractures, both of which are common when a person is brutally beaten to death. The autopsy did find a fracture of her thyroid cartilage, which was located in her neck. This particular injury caused a huge amount of debate. Dr. Radish believed it may have been indicative of strangulation, which supported that Michael had hurt Kathleen. But there were no other signs of strangulation. There was no bruising around her neck area, no petechial hemorrhages, and her hyoid bone was not broken. These are much more common signs of strangulation. And according to Michael's book, Behind the Staircase, Kathleen did suffer a neck injury about three months before December 9th. She had dove into the shallow end of the pool while tipsy at their empty nest party they threw after their youngest, Martha, left for college that fall. Kathleen had worn a neck brace for weeks after. Could this cartilage injury have been caused by that? I don't know but I have a gut feeling. I had knee surgery several years ago after an MRI and x-rays showed no broken bones or cartilage, but they thought I might have a torn meniscus. Well, I didn't, but I had 10 pieces of broken cartilage floating around in my kneecap area. I had dislocated my kneecap is what started it all, and yet they didn't see the broken cartilage on the tests. And that was 10 pieces of broken cartilage floating around. My point is, she dove into the shallow end of that pool, hit her head, and went to the hospital. But if that cartilage piece was as small as anatomy diagrams show it was, I think it is possible they could have missed it. It wasn't broken. It was a small fracture. It is also a possibility that she got it falling down the stairs. A broken neck, and of course cartilage in that area, is also one of the many common injuries from falling down the stairs. But as for her previous neck injury that September, it was bad. She was still in pain, still taking Valium and Flexeril, a common muscle relaxant, in December, even though the original injury was in early September. Flexeril wasn't mentioned in Kathleen's toxicology screening, but then it might be something you have to look for. And Michael said she sometimes took Flexeril, although he wasn't sure if she had taken any earlier that day or evening into the night. He did remember the Valium, though. In addition to all this, Kathleen's autopsy also showed that she had numerous bruises and abrasions on her face, back, and the back of her arms, wrists, and hands. These could be indicative of a fall, but if they were defensive wounds, you would think they would be much more severe, considering the damage to her scalp. Also, she had small abrasions and bruises around her eyes, which would be unusual in a fall or in a beating, as the occipital bones in your face would protect those areas. But for our owl theory enthusiasts, a beak could definitely hit those areas. Also for our owl people, Kathleen did have two pine needles stuck to her right hand and a wood splinter was found in the hair on the back of her head, but we'll get to the potential significance of that later. A section from Kathleen's central area, which is an airway, showed a small amount of blood. This is important to note because a defense expert would point out that some of the blood spatter could have been from Kathleen coughing. She did not aspirate and did not have blood in her lungs, so the prosecution always denied this theory that she had blood in her mouth and coughed. But the autopsy does show blood in her airway, which supports the theory that when she sat up, blood had run into her mouth and throat and she coughed, creating that blood spatter. Kathleen's blood alcohol content was 0.07. Her urine ethanol concentration was 0.11. Remember, she and Michael had been drinking out by the pool. They were celebrating his book being turned into a movie. She was not drunk, but maybe tipsy. But Kathleen's autopsy also revealed that she had taken between 5 and 15 milligrams of Valium. Medical experts believed it's likely she took the Valium shortly before she died, which Michael confirmed. 
Kathleen had been suffering from severe migraines, either from her earlier injury or from work stress. I think it could have been from the earlier injury, but I know that is up for debate, so here I go again. I hate to keep bringing myself into this, but right now I need surgery on my neck for bulging discs, bone spurs, and a pinched nerve. I am in extreme pain often, but the surgery is being put off because it is still too soon for me after surviving sepsis and all the following corrective back surgeries I underwent. But I am scheduled for another round of epidural shots to help with the pain caused by these issues, and I have headaches, often turning into migraines all the time, and the only thing that relieves these headaches are muscle relaxers. By the way, that is why this episode is so late. I have had several migraines this past week when I needed to record, and I cannot record on muscle relaxers. My vision is too blurred to read the script, and I sound drunk. But back to Kathleen and the Valium. According to experts, that amount of Valium would have reacted with the alcohol in Kathleen's system. The effects of both substances would have been greater than normal. In other words, Kathleen was almost certainly feeling a little out of it. Later, in court, prosecutors would sneer at her level of intoxication, pointing out that it was below the legal level so she could drive a car. First of all, ignoring how mixing Valium with alcohol would have intensified her intoxication. And second of all, I would love to hear them cross-examine that argument in court for a car accident when one of the drivers was close to legal intoxication. You can bet your ass they would have considered the Valium mixed with alcohol an impairment. Moving on. As I said, Kathleen's autopsy was performed on December 9th. The next day on Monday, December 10th, 2001, Assistant Commander Connie Bullock of the Durham Police called medical examiner Dr. Snell. Commander Bullock knew that Dr. Snell had reported Kathleen's death was possibly due to a fall, but Bullock disagreed with that conclusion. The assistant commander, along with the rest of the Durham police, were sure that Michael murdered Kathleen Peterson. Only after this conversation did Dr. Snell waver in his opinion. He went from, it was probably a fall, to, it might be due to something other than a fall. I will interject here to say that the police talking to the ME isn't exactly uncommon or unlawful. You would think that a medical examiner should not be influenced by police, but they do often work together. Police might ask an ME to look for something particular, like looking for signs of strangulation or requesting certain drugs be tested for in the talk screen. But they should not be telling them to change their conclusions which does seem to be the case here. Fast forward two months later, on February 18, 2002, the autopsy results were signed and made public. At this point, Dr. Snell developed a completely different conclusion about Kathleen's death. If you look at the report, the original findings were even crossed out. Following ongoing discussions with the police, who continued to believe Michael killed Kathleen, Dr. Snell no longer thought Kathleen fell. On the autopsy report, Snell authorized a new cause of death, blunt force trauma of the head. This would be shocking to absolutely no one, since Michael will already be in jail by this time. And the papers had been reporting this cause of death for weeks. But we'll get to that momentarily. According to court documents, Dr. Snell said, quote, in my opinion, the cause of death in this case was due to severe concussive injury of the brain caused by multiple blunt force impacts of the head. Blood loss from the deep scalp lacerations may have also played a role in her death. The number, severity, locations, and orientation of these injuries are inconsistent with a fall down the stairs. Instead, they are indicative of multiple impacts received as a result of a beating. Okay, this is bizarre even to a lay person. We already know that Kathleen did not suffer a traumatic brain injury. No contusions, no skull fractures, nothing. So it would seem that she exsanguinated, 
meaning she bled to death from the lacerations. Literally, it was all that blood at the crime scene that made her death suspicious in the first place, not the autopsy. Hell, Dr. Snell ordered the autopsy because of all the blood, so that wording, deep scalp lacerations may have played a role, is suspect. I would love to know how much blood Kathleen Peterson lost. I've combed the report. There is no mention of blood volume, but considering that crime scene, she had to have bled out so much. And back at the crime scene, forensic evidence technician Dan George collected Michael and Todd's clothing. George put all of Michael's clothes into a single paper bag to be transported to the police station. Todd's clothing was packaged the same way. Later, it was revealed that this was not the correct evidence collection procedure. George should have documented the stains on the clothing before he bagged them. Now that they had been folded and stored in a tight place, no one knew what stains were originals versus transfer stains. Any blood spatter analysis would be moot. Or should have been anyway. A technician named Angie was assigned to photograph the crime scene, and Angie was new. She hadn't even completed her training. Her mistakes were probably not with ill intent. But, as a beginner in the field, Angie's photography skills were lacking. She missed a lot of crucial images. Bloodstains and other important items in the Petersons' home were never photographed. Plus, there was a problem with so-called glitches in the photographs. Imagine two pictures of a single stair step, but with different blood spatter patterns. That's what was happening, but not just with pictures of the stair steps, with lots of pictures of many things. That's a big deal in a case where blood spatters would be meticulously analyzed by the world's leading experts. Which blood spatter pattern was more recent to Kathleen's death? There was no way to know. And, as it turns out, some of these differing blood spatters were not blood at all. They were the photograph glitches I mentioned, dark spots that were accidentally caused when the crime scene photos were developed. As a result of these glitches, it was almost impossible to know for sure which crime scene photo had an accurate representation of Kathleen's blood spatter. On the evening of Sunday, December 9th, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation arrived. The Bureau is more commonly known as the SBI, so I will call it that from now on. Crime scene technician Eric Campen had requested them. He needed help interpreting the bloodstains. So SBI agent Dwayne Deaver arrived at the house around 5 p.m. Deaver reviewed the photographs that had been taken and processed. Then, he examined the bloodstains on the staircase. Agent Deaver's bloodstain analysis will be very important in the upcoming court proceedings. For now, we're going to talk about Deaver's interaction with the crime scene on this one day, December 9, 2001. We'll get into the evolution of his analysis, his interesting experiments, and his testimony later on. It's important to understand the context of Deaver's bloodstain examination. He was not analyzing a pristine, untouched crime scene. Over 12 hours had passed since Michael's original 911 call. Approximately 10 police officers had been in and out of the house repeatedly. Michael had, in his grief, shifted Kathleen's body on multiple occasions. Medical examiner Dr. Snell had walked up and down the bloody stairwell. The photographer, Angie, had been in the stairwell to take pictures, and when the EMTs removed Kathleen's body from the scene, she was still dripping blood. As her body was relocated, new blood spatters were created. Agent Deaver was in a tough situation, but it's not like he had a choice. This was the crime scene he had been dealt. Later in court, it was revealed that Deaver did not know other people had walked through the crime scene. That day, Deaver took numerous measurements and calculations, and in his initial report, Agent Deaver did not find a cast-off pattern in Kathleen's blood spatters. 
To understand Kathleen Peterson's case, we have to understand cast-off patterns. What are they? In the context of Kathleen Peterson's case, cast-off pattern refers to the blood droplets flung off a weapon mid-strike. As in, if Michael Peterson had beaten Kathleen to death, each time he raised the weapon after the first blow, an arc of blood droplets would fly through the air. They would be, quote, cast-off of the weapon. Then the cast-off blood pattern would be visible in a linear formation on the floor, walls, or ceiling. Forensic analysts can use a cast-off blood pattern to confirm that a weapon was used. Cast-off patterns are also helpful when narrowing down the direction an assailant was standing. But, like I said, at this time, Agent Deaver did not see any cast-off patterns of blood in the stairwell. Agent Deaver also looked for strike marks on the walls. If Michael had beaten Kathleen to death in the stairwell, it would have been tricky not to bump into the walls. The enclosed staircase was pretty narrow. But Agent Deaver didn't find any strike marks, other than the normal dings, wear and tear expected in a family home. And he did find that the stains on the doorway and near the floor were consistent with Kathleen's head banging into those surfaces. Deaver agreed with the fire captain. The bloodstains on Kathleen's feet meant she probably stood up after she began to bleed. That same day, on Sunday, December 9th, technician Eric Campen performed luminol testing. He focused the testing on the stairs, trying to see if there were any trace amounts of blood that the naked eye couldn't see. When he sprayed the luminol mixture at the top of the stairs, it reacted. It turned fluorescent blue under a black light, right next to the second floor landing's linen closet. This indicated that blood might have been at the top of the stairway. But how could that be? Everything else indicated that Kathleen had fallen on the bottom few steps, unless Michael had started beating Kathleen at the top of the stairs and cleaned up the mess after. Luminol would have detected the blood even if it had been cleaned up. But conversely, this luminol reaction may have been caused by crime scene contamination. Both medical examiner Dr. Snell and the photographer Angie had walked through Kathleen's blood and stood at the top of the stairwell. Forget Michael Peterson for a moment. Forget his guilt. Forget his innocence. At the end of the day, the police bungled this investigation, and they grossly mishandled the crime scene. Due to negligence and poor professionalism, the authorities ruined the integrity of countless pieces of evidence. In the 48 hours following Kathleen's death, who knows exactly what important details were lost forever. Michael was a smart guy. Right from the jump, he knew the police thought he had killed Kathleen. In interviews, Michael's son Todd recalled how the police treated him and his father as criminals. Michael told the documentarians, quote, I knew for a fact that no way ever in this world would my father hurt Kathleen, but the realism of their investigating, it did seem real. While it was completely unfounded in my mind, the way that they were behaving, the way that they were barking orders at us, restricting us from talking to one another, they truly drove home the point that they were investigating this as a crime. On Sunday, Michael's two adoptive daughters, Margaret and Martha, arrived to 1810 Cedar Street. Police would not allow them in the house, so Michael came outside. He was still in shock, shaking. According to Martha's account, Michael told his daughters emphatically, I didn't do it. And Margaret and Martha responded, Dad, we believe you. This is horrible. How can we not believe you? As police were searching his home on Sunday, Michael contacted several defense lawyers, including attorney Carrie Sutton. Sutton had co-managed Michael's unsuccessful mayoral campaign in 1999. Sutton publicly criticized the Durham police for treating Michael poorly. In fact, she later told the Herald Sun that the police barred Michael from speaking to her in person on Sunday. When Sutton arrived at the Peterson home, Durham police investigator Art Holland met with her. Holland said he would send Michael down the driveway 
when he, meaning Holland, was comfortable. But as time passed, it became apparent to Sutton that Holland was not going to let Michael exit the house. Holland had fed her a line of bullshit. Another lawyer representing Michael said the police made Michael a prisoner in his own home. Already, tensions were high between Michael's legal team and Durham police, and they would only get higher. Following his attorney's advice, Michael did not speak to the authorities. And that was probably wise, because the authorities were not on Michael's side. Durham police major Steve Chalmers told the Herald Sun that they were treating Kathleen's death as suspicious until all evidence and tests that are performed prove otherwise. And now we come to the part where your friendly neighborhood true crime podcaster reminds you to never talk to the police without a lawyer if you have been involved in any type of incident. They are allowed to mislead you. They are allowed to outright lie to you. Don't worry about how lawyering up looks, as cop shows put it. You have every right to protect yourself. If you happen to be friends with law enforcement, they will tell you the exact same thing. The city of Durham first heard of Kathleen's death on Monday, December 10th, and it was big news. As you know from my last episode, Kathleen was an involved community member. One person said Kathleen was the Martha Stewart of Durham. And of course, Michael was a well-known author. He also wrote a column twice a week for a while in the local newspaper, The Herald Sun, where he was very critical of the police, the DA's office, and politics in general, which caused him to run unsuccessfully for mayor in 1999. Just a month before Kathleen's death in November of 2001, Michael had run for another political office, city council member. He lost, but Durham residents would have noticed his name on the ballot. So in Durham's newspaper, The Herald Sun, published an article entitled Wife of City Council Candidate Dies, people took note and they picked up on the nuance of the article's subtitle. Kathleen Peterson was found dead in her home from an apparent fall. Despite the paper's carefully chosen words, the article was mostly an homage to Kathleen's passing, a recognition of her kindness, generosity, and friendship. The first Herald Sun article does not accuse Michael Peterson of killing his wife. Not yet, anyway. That would come the next day on Tuesday, December 11th, when the new Herald Sun headline read, Police Call Peterson's Death Suspicious, subtitled, Wife of Durham Political Figure Died Sunday When She Apparently Fell Down the Stairs, again with the apparently's. On the afternoon of Monday, December 10th, police obtained a search warrant for Michael Peterson's home. The warrant allowed the police to search for evidence related to Kathleen's death. Fingerprints, bloodstains, weapons, trace hair and clothing fibers, security footage, etc. The same day, the police gathered for a briefing to prepare for the upcoming search. During that briefing, the police officers were shown a photograph of the crime scene. It was of a slender bloodstain, magnified intensely. The image had no reference, so it was impossible to tell how large the stain was. The police officers were asked what could have caused this stain. One officer said he believed the stain was indicative of an instrument with a long handle, like a tire iron or a fireplace tool. Later in court, it would be revealed that this officer had no idea that the blood stain pictured was only one inch long. It was yet another problem with the undertrained police photographer, another glitch, so to speak. Following this briefing, with fireplace tools freshly implanted in their minds, the police conducted an extensive search of Peterson's stately mansion. Approximately 30 officers were divided into five search teams. These search teams scoured the exterior of the house. A group of homicide investigators searched the house's interior. During this search, no weapon was recovered, nor any indication that someone with blood on them left the property, walked out of the house, or down to the basement. If there was a bloody murder weapon somewhere, the perpetrator had not left with it. It had to be on the Peterson property. 
Although the police could not find a weapon, they did seize numerous other items for evidence. These included blood and hair from the bottom steps of the staircase, a paperweight, an O.J. Simpson notebook, condoms from a bookcase, socks and tennis shoes found near Kathleen, Michael's watch, wine glasses, wine bottles, paperwork from Michael's office, and a blood sample from the kitchen cabinet. But you won't be surprised to hear that the police missed other important items. As in, they didn't seize items that were prime candidates for seizing. The wireless phone that had been laying in the blood and had been removed from the stairway by Todd. The flip-flops Kathleen had been wearing. The towels that were placed under her head. The house keys, which were left in the front door of the house. And Kathleen's eyeglasses that were on the stairs. In court, forensics expert Dan George would say he didn't collect the eyeglasses because there were no bloodstains on them. Michael's defense lawyers would pose the question, how could a person be violently bludgeoned on their head without getting blood on their glasses? A mind tickler for sure. Even if there wasn't blood on them, they were on the stairs. Surely that would be part of the crime scene evidence near the body. And they literally left the bloody towels that had been under her head, not to mention her flip-flops. But God forbid they miss a paperweight in his office or a novelty O.J. Simpson notebook. O.J. Simpson's memoir was not written until years after this, so it had to be a novelty item. And prosecutors never again brought this item up, so it obviously wasn't relevant. And yet so many pieces of real evidence were left behind. That evening, still on Monday, December 10th, crime scene technician Eric Campen returned with forensics expert Dan George to perform more luminol testing. They sprayed luminol on the floors of the kitchen, laundry room, and other adjoining rooms. Their decision-making process here is confusing at best and shoddy crime scene investigation work at worst. First, Let's address that Campen and George performed this luminol testing a day and a half after the alleged crime. During most of that time, the crime scene was largely unsecured. So for 36 hours, the police, Michael, Todd, neighbors, the medical examiner, the photographer, and others had been running amok through the Peterson house. Then, once Campen and George administered the luminol test, they didn't document where it reacted. They didn't take any pictures. They didn't draft a diagram. Instead, they claimed they saw bare footprints leading a trail around the Petersons' house. They claimed someone with trace amounts of blood on their bare feet had walked from the kitchen to the laundry room, then returned to the kitchen. But you know what? None of this should matter without documentation. You can photograph luminol testing. Forget about modern technology we have now. I found it in a forensic science textbook dating back to 1973. So Campen and George could have photographed these supposed footprints. They just needed to have been prepared. But since they did not officially document this testing, you would think it wouldn't be allowed in court. You would think. Later, TV pundits like Nancy Grace would have a field day speculating that Michael had walked around cleaning up blood. Pundits are going to do their thing, but crime scene technicians shouldn't be allowed to talk about evidence that they have no proof of. But this testimony did reveal one important thing. No blood was found in the sink, in the laundry room, in the washing machine, or on the household mop and bucket. If Michael had killed Kathleen, he had not made any attempt to clean up the blood. The police wrapped up their two-day search by 9 p.m. on Tuesday, December 11th. After 40 hours of investigating, they were finally done. It had been less than three days since Kathleen's death. But from afar, the sprawling Peterson mansion looked practically normal. The police tape was removed. No unfamiliar cars were parked in the driveway. But this wouldn't last for long. Because on Wednesday evening, as Michael, his sons, his daughters, and his brother were preparing to attend Kathleen's viewing, the police returned. They had another search warrant, this time for Michael's computer and other technology. 
For about two hours, 10 police officers searched the Peterson home once more. As a result of this search, the police confiscated two computers from the second floor, plus one computer from Michael's study. Michael's defense lawyer, Sutton, told the Herald Sun that the police were probably trying to access the house while it was empty. One officer explained to Sutton that they were prepared to break down the door. As a result of the police's impromptu search, Michael did not get to go to his wife's wake. He was angered by the intrusion at the time of Kathleen's wake and stayed at the house to watch the police. By the time he got to the funeral home, the hundred or more people who had come to visit were gone and only his immediate family was still there. I think you can understand his paranoia and anger at this point. He had cooperated with their searches, and now they come in like gangbusters on the evening of Kathleen's wake for yet another search? They could have come during the day instead of disrupting the family before the wake or needlessly breaking down the door that evening. It was disrespectful at best, sneaky at worst. As the police's animosity toward Michael became more and more apparent, the public was increasingly flabbergasted. Numerous people praised Michael and Kathleen's relationship. Several told the Herald Sun that the couple was just so happy. They were two peas in a pod, adorable, and very family-oriented. Everything was done for their five kids, and one person said Kathleen always spoke lovingly of her husband. The Peterson family bond seemed to be holding strong, too. At the beginning, all five children were certain that their parents' relationship was loving, that Michael would never have hurt, let alone killed Kathleen. Caitlin Atwater, Kathleen's daughter from her previous marriage, told reporters, quote, My mother and Mike had an absolutely loving relationship, and there is no way that either one of them would ever wish any sort of harm on the other one. Years later, Margaret told the Staircase documentarians that her family was extremely close. They didn't let conflicts fester. They addressed them out in the open. If Michael and Kathleen had been fighting, Margaret was confident she would have known about it. That might sound a little naive. Kids don't always know what's going on. But Michael's son Todd echoed Margaret's sentiment. By all accounts, Michael and Kathleen had appeared content satisfied, happy. And later in court, the prosecution could not find one single person who would say a bad word about the Peterson marriage. Even Candace, Kathleen's sister, who would become an extreme presence against Michael in court, would have to admit on the stand that she never saw a bad marriage. On Thursday, December 13th of 2001, Kathleen Peterson's funeral was held. Hundreds of Kathleen's friends and family attended. They remembered Kathleen's many contributions to the Durham community, delivering croissants to her neighbors on Christmas Eve, running in the annual Thanksgiving 5K race known as the Turkey Trot, her dedication to local art, her compassion, her patience. The Reverend reminded the mourners of Kathleen's love for dancing. He recalled, that Kathleen and Michael had attended a Christmas party one day before her death. The Reverend said, Hold in your mind the image of Kathleen dancing, just as she did Friday night, late into the night, with Michael. Meanwhile, the police were examining the data on Michael's confiscated computer. They discovered sexually explicit images and emails of a homosexual nature. In other words, Michael had looked at and downloaded gay porn, and Michael was sending sexual emails to another man. According to the prosecuting lawyer's interviews with the docuseries The Staircase, this evidence led them to come up with the following scenario. On the night of Kathleen's death, she had a late-night work phone call from her Nortel colleague, Helen. After this phone call, Kathleen happened to look at Michael's computer. Then, she saw the gay porn and sexual emails to another man. According to, quote, persons that know her well, including her sister, Kathleen would have been furious. She would have been insulted that Michael was cheating on her, and it would have been salt in the wound when she realized that Michael was cheating on her with a man. 
Kathleen, humiliated and embarrassed, confronted Michael about the affair. An argument ensued, and a homicide occurred. The police felt they now had a clear motive. This was why Michael, who had seemed to have the perfect marriage with Kathleen, bludgeoned his wife to death. Firstly, Michael was cheating on her. And secondly, he was bisexual, which in the early 2000s was a scandal unto itself. North Carolina had explicitly banned same-sex marriage in 1996, only five years prior. State officials would affirm this ban in 2012. In North Carolina, gay marriage would not be legal until federal courts forced them to make it legal on October 14, 2014. But for now, in December of 2001, only a week after Kathleen's death, Michael's bisexuality was largely unknown. The general public had no idea. Sure, Michael Peterson wrote about gay soldiers in his novels, but those were fictional, not autobiographical. So who did know about Michael's bisexuality? Bill, Michael's brother, told documentarians that he had known of his brother's sexuality since childhood. Bill also said that their parents knew as well. Michael's first wife, Patty, knew. And, according to Michael, even Kathleen knew. But, of course, he would be highly motivated to say that. Regardless of who might have known, the Durham police now definitely knew, and the police wanted Michael to know that. On the evening of Wednesday, December 12th, when the authorities took Michael's computer, they left behind a single telling photograph. They had obtained it from Michael's computer, printed it out, and purposefully placed it on a clean table in Michael's den. The picture was of gay porn. Michael's brother Bill felt the image was an intimidation tactic, a message, as if the police were saying, quote, We know what you're like, we know this secret life of yours, and we don't like it, and we're going to do something about it. Now I ask you, if you're leaning towards guilt, put that aside. What if he was innocent? and his bisexual trysts were just that, not emotional affairs that hurt his marriage, but just sex. Or, what if he just looked at those images? We live in a time now where we don't kink shame what kind of porn people look at, but not then. So on the evening before his wife's funeral, Michael Peterson basically got a threat from the police. Even if they never charged him, they would leak this information. Even if he no longer cared about his own reputation, he did now have to tell his children about his sexuality before they saw it on the news. Everything else was already being leaked. Within two days, the newspapers would report on the findings of blunt force trauma, even though the autopsy wouldn't be released for two months. So why wouldn't they leak this too? In Michael's interviews for the Staircase documentary, he was candid about his relationships with men except Michael wouldn't categorize them as relationships. From the way he described it, his affairs with these men were purely sexual. He did not love them. He loved Kathleen. He was committed solely to Kathleen. But he had always desired men, and according to Michael, Kathleen allowed that. Later, when Michael was preparing for his trial, a man named Dennis Rowe provided the prosecution with a statement. In this one-and-a-half-page, handwritten document, Dennis claimed he and Michael had sexual relations recently. Dennis was actually a childhood friend of Kathleen's, having grown up just down the street from her in Lancaster. Like Kathleen and Michael, Dennis attended Duke University, but it was years after the Petersons did. Dennis was about 10 years younger than Kathleen and almost 20 years younger than Michael. After graduating from Duke with his bachelor's in English, Dennis worked in the Duke Medical Center Library. He also designed gowns and other textiles for clients nationwide. And in 2004, Dennis worked in tech support for the U.S. Postal Service. Three years after Kathleen's death, on Tuesday, November 23, 2004, 42-year-old Dennis was murdered. He was found stuffed upside down in a trash can, bound with duct tape. Dennis's roommate, Tyrone LaCour, had stabbed and beaten him to death. At first, 
the media wanted to draw a connection between Dennis's murder and Kathleen's death. Both of their autopsies reported that they died from blunt force trauma of the head, and Dennis, like Kathleen, had no skull fractures. But the two deaths were wholly unrelated. In an interview with the News and Observer, Dennis's killer, Tyrone LaCour, confirmed this. Tyrone attributed him murdering his roommate to mounting tensions. In January of 2009, after fleeing the authorities for almost two years, Tyrone pled guilty to second-degree murder. He was incarcerated for almost 16 years before his release in June of 2020. While Michael admitted to having sex with other men while married to Kathleen, he always denied sleeping with Dennis Rowe. And Dennis's handwritten statement never made it into the courtroom. Many have wondered why. With Dennis's statement, the prosecution could have shown that Michael had had an extramarital affair recently. And even worse, Kathleen had known Dennis. The prosecution could claim that this particular affair was the catalyst that caused Michael to murder Kathleen. Perhaps Kathleen had felt the Dennis affair was the last straw, approached Michael, and then Michael took violent action. After all, all his other affairs were earlier on in his and Kathleen's relationship. Speculators wondered if Dennis's statement did not appear in court because he may have revealed sensitive information while on the stand. There are rumors that Dennis had sex with multiple high-profile Durham residents. Residents who did not want to be outed as gay or bisexual men. Maybe that was why the prosecution was motivated to keep him off the stand. As I stated earlier, it was not okay to be gay in North Carolina for a long, long time. And if you were gay and trying to get promoted or re-elected in the early 2000s, ugh, good luck with that. And it's not like Dennis Rowe was a drug addict or otherwise unseemly. He was college-educated with a good job. Why else wouldn't the prosecution use him? While it's unclear if Dennis and Michael had sexual relations, Michael's computer did reveal other information that was helpful to the police. Michael had communicated with a male escort from Raleigh named Brent Walgamot. He went by Brad as an escort. For the record, he was also an Army pharmacy specialist stationed at Fort Bragg and was seeking his master's degree. Later, the judge would allow him to mask his identity in court because not only was he worried about his future employers, but this was the height of don't ask, don't tell in the military. But the media outed him anyway. Walgamot would later describe this experience as freeing, but at the time, it was really unfair since he and Michael had never even met. Brad and Michael had exchanged emails for several months, from August to September of 2001. In those emails, Brad and Michael discussed meeting in person, but the timing never worked out. In those emails, Michael shared many personal details with Brad. Michael said he was bisexual, and although he loved his wife dearly, he was interested in a paid, physical-only relationship with Brad. To Brad, this seemed normal. As a male escort, he had seen a lot of men who he said were straight but with slight homosexual tendencies, basically closeted bisexuals, though he never said it that way later on the stand. The only startling part of the ordeal, according to Brad, was how committed Michael was to his wife. Usually, Brad's clients complained about their spouses, but not Michael. He had gone out of his way to explain his love for Kathleen. However, that piece of information did not sway investigators. They felt Brad was a clear indication that Kathleen and Michael's idyllic marriage was actually a facade. Michael was a closeted bisexual. Kathleen had found out about Brad. They fought, Michael killed her, and that was that. Frankly, Dennis Rowe would have been a more compelling witness if they had an actual physical affair. All Michael and Brad did was email each other. But the prosecution didn't care. They thought it was proof enough and could drop the Roe testimony, which was apparently a political hot potato for them. On Friday, December 14th, Durham police continued to collect evidence from Michael Peterson's home. They seized molding and wood pieces from the stairway. You know, physical evidence you would think they'd already taken. On December 16th, the Herald Sun reported that medical investigators said Kathleen died from blunt force trauma to the head. 
If you'll recall, the autopsy would not come out for another two months. It is unclear why the medical examiner, Dr. Snell, told the newspapers this conclusion so early. As if someone wanted the public to think that Michael had murdered Kathleen. Before he had even taken one step into the courtroom, Michael would be damned by the court of public opinion. On Monday, December 17th, investigators were reviewing Kathleen and Michael's phone records. By this point, police had obtained five search warrants to collect evidence from the Petersons' home. The detectives also went to the funeral home. They performed a rape kit on Kathleen because a condom had been found in the Peterson bedroom. Michael scoffed that they didn't even use condoms. Kathleen could not get pregnant. She had had great difficulty getting pregnant with Caitlin when she was a much younger woman. Todd would later explain to the police that the condom was from a friend of his who had sex in Michael and Kathleen's bed when the boys had had a party at the house that Thanksgiving before Kathleen's death. She traditionally hosted a big Thanksgiving dinner for all her children and her sister's families. She changed her mind that year. She and Michael went and visited her mother in Florida instead. So the boys seized the opportunity and threw a rager and then did a shitty job cleaning up. Regardless, there was absolutely no indication that Kathleen had been sexually assaulted. The scene did not look at all like a sex crime, especially if you think because the husband is cheating on his wife with men. Even if the Petersons did use condoms, what would that matter? But performing a rape kit on his wife's body mattered very much to Michael, who was very angry and upset about it and tried to block it from happening. The funeral director said it would delay Kathleen's wake because the police would just have to come back with a warrant, so Michael finally agreed to it. If he was innocent, you can only imagine how outraged he would feel about his wife's body being treated this way at the funeral home. She had already undergone an autopsy. This felt like a desecration. The rape kit was negative. Again, Peterson was upset needlessly by investigators on a guess. I think he kept this detail from his children at the time, but they would certainly find out later. And by now, Michael was getting nervous. The police had not named him a suspect. They hadn't pressed any charges, but he could see the writing on the wall. So he hired a new, well-known defense attorney, David Rudolph. Rudolph had a reputation as one of the best defense lawyers in all of North Carolina, and in the U.S. for that matter. He earned his law degree from New York University in 1974, so you cannot help but notice he doesn't have the same folksy accent the prosecution does at trial. Many people feel that hurt with the jury, but it doesn't mean Rudolph wasn't a successful, well-respected defense attorney. David Rudolph is a Jewish man from New York, and there is no mistaking his New York accent, although it isn't very thick. It's just so different from the overly dramatic Southern accents we will hear from the prosecution. After graduation, Rudolph spent eight years working as a federal defender in New York. In 1982, he opened his own law firm. And by 2001, he was the vice president of the North Carolina Academy of Trial Lawyers. Before Michael's case, Rudolph had already saved two men who were accused of murder from the death penalty. One of the men had his case dropped and ended up winning a related civil lawsuit for $8.6 million. The Herald's son hailed Rudolph as legendary. Another lawyer said, He is the most meticulously prepared lawyer I have ever met. Co-founder of the Innocence Project, Barry Sheck, is a close friend of Rudolph's. Sheck said of his friend, He has a national reputation as being one of the finest criminal defense lawyers around. I don't think there's a major case I have tried where I haven't called Dave for advice. The day after Michael hired Rudolph, the Durham District Attorney, Jim Harden Jr., held a special grand jury session. It was the first of its kind in over a decade for Durham. It makes you wonder if Harden wasn't sure they had enough evidence to bring charges. David Rudolph didn't even know the grand jury was taking place until journalists asked him about it. Grand juries are supposed to be held in secret, but here we go with these leaks again. Once he was notified, Rudolph expected the grand jury would indict his client. He told the Herald Sun, grand jurors hear one side of the story, the police side, but also 
as the old saying goes, you can indict a ham sandwich if that's what you want. Still, it would seem Harden wasn't hedging his bets. And Rudolph was right. On Thursday, December 20th, 11 days after his wife's death, 58-year-old Michael Ivor Peterson was indicted for first-degree murder. An hour after the indictment was announced, Michael surrendered himself to the police. He was held in the Durham County Jail without bail. Since it was the holidays, he sat in jail for almost a month waiting on his bond hearing. On January 15, 2002, Michael was released on an $850,000 bond. The next day, Michael's indictment was front-page news in Durham. Rudolph blasted the prosecution for relying so heavily on circumstantial evidence and, worse, a contaminated crime scene. When speaking with the Herald Sun, Rudolph pointed out that Michael and Kathleen's home was notoriously unlocked, easy to break into. Since Michael and Kathleen had purchased their large home, it had been broken into at least three times. Their cars were ransacked so often that Michael simply left his tan Jaguar unlocked to avoid paying for yet another broken window. Why hadn't the police suspected an intruder, wondered Rudolph to journalists. Why did they turn to Michael so quickly and with so little evidence? David Rudolph told reporters, For us, if in fact the police are right, that this was not a fall, that should have been the beginning of the investigation, not the end of the investigation. Michael was devastated. His family was confused. Durham was shocked. Bill, Michael's brother, told the Herald Sun, we know he had nothing to do with this terrible accident. Michael's co-author, David Perlmutt, who spoke to Kathleen the day before she died, said, they admired each other and loved one another and were supportive of each other. I just have not seen a glimpse of anything that would tell me he was capable of violence, let alone first-degree murder. Michael's neighbor, Maureen Barry, confirmed this sentiment. She told reporters, I still believe him to be innocent and have no idea why he was indicted. But five months later, police would discover a detail from Michael's past that would propel his case from local celebrity to national stardom. A detail that would permanently damn him in the eyes of many people. And that detail was Elizabeth Ratliff, the mother of Michael's two adopted daughters, Margaret and Martha. Liz Ratliff was found dead in November of 1985 by Margaret and Martha's nanny, a woman named Barbara. She was found at the foot of her stairs. Barbara ran past her body to go get the little girls and then ran to Michael Peterson's house for help. He lived just a few doors down. She banged on his door, screaming and crying. Michael ran over in a t-shirt and boxers, even though there was snow on the ground. He calmed the nanny down and called the authorities. I am going to once again state for the record that Liz Ratliff was not then, nor was she ever, Michael's wife. His first wife was Patty. Kathleen was his only other wife. Sorry to be a broken record, but there are still people on social media spreading this misinformation. We also need to clear up another common misconception, or rather, something that has gotten glossed over or condensed for time over the years. You will often read or hear that Michael had two women in his life that he found dead at the bottom of a staircase. The implication is that he was alone with both of these women when they were found dead. That's not true. He did not find Liz Ratliff. The nanny found Liz, and instead of calling the police herself, she ran a few doors down hysterically crying and banging on the Peterson's door. He and his wife Patty were close friends with Liz, so he did go running over there to try and help. Patty also showed up soon after. It is still obviously a coincidence, but give me just a moment and I'll go into that. The nanny had thought Liz might still be alive because her body felt warm. But Michael had to break it to her that she was gone. Her body was still warm due to the heated flooring, which was common in German households. As per German law, a doctor was called to the scene because it was an unattended death, not because it was a crime scene. She was not in rigor mortis and she had not been dead long. The doctor did a spinal tap on Liz's body while she was still where she was found. He found blood in the spinal fluid, which indicated a cerebral hemorrhage. 
There were a few of Liz's friends who came over while the doctor was there and then when American military authorities showed up. Liz worked as a teacher for the Department of Defense, just like Patty, and was the widow of a war veteran. The MPs would not have taken her death lightly. If foul play had been suspected, they would have investigated. But no one suspected foul play. None of the officials at the scene reported seeing much blood. They didn't even see a reason to take photographs of the scene. But I will go into this in further detail on the next episode. For now, just know that Liz's body was sent to an army pathologist who confirmed the cause of death to be a cerebral hemorrhage. Then, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology also reviewed Liz's autopsy and brain tissue. The chief of the Division of Forensic Pathology agreed that Liz's death was due to unexpected bleeding in the brain in conjunction with her prior health issues. That is three doctors one German and two American, who said Liz Ratliff died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Liz had fallen down the stairs when the hemorrhage occurred, very much like a stroke. It is often called a stroke by journalists and other media. Liz had been suffering from terrible headaches, and she had a rare blood disorder. But she did suffer several injuries when she fell down the stairs, actually more severe than Kathleen's. It's possible that she fell from a higher step. Following Liz's death, Michael and Patty took custody of Margaret and Martha. They were about two and a half and 18 months old. Michael and Patty received a $70,000 life insurance policy, which, according to Michael's legal team, was spent exclusively on the girls. Just for your reference, it costs about upwards of $17,000 a year to raise a child these days. In the 80s, when Michael took custody of the girls, it was about $12,000 a year. And you've got to double that with two girls, making it around $24,000 a year. So the Ratliff life insurance would basically have run out about two and a half to three years after Liz's death. And Michael and Patty divorced in 1987. She did not want to raise the girls or help after the divorce. He was on his own. He also did get the rest of the Ratliff estate as far as art, fine china and crystal ware, expensive rugs, and so on. And why wouldn't he? He took custody of the girls, was left the life insurance, and he still lived in Germany. Liz's family was in America. But still, once he was under suspicion of murder, even this was seen as nefarious. But still, he really received no financial benefit from Liz's death. If anything, he took on a great financial expense taking in the two girls, not to mention the incredible personal responsibility he assumed in becoming their father. So why would Michael be motivated to kill Liz Ratliff? Perhaps it was the same reason that Michael was believed to be motivated to kill Kathleen. He was having an affair, this time with a woman, Liz herself. Maybe these daughters that Michael was so willing to adopt were actually his biological daughters. That was the line of thinking for the prosecution anyway. But when they tested Michael's DNA in comparison with Margaret and Martha Ratliff's, they concluded that Michael was not the father. It was an ugly, disgusting rumor that hurt the girls immensely, on top of everything else they were going through. Even Diane Fanning, who was definitely pro-guilt in her book on the case, slammed the prosecution for this move. In May of 2002, Liz's sister, Margaret Blair, informed the Durham police of the odd coincidences between Liz and Kathleen's deaths. Initially, Blair said she was conflicted about going to the authorities, so she consulted her priest. Blair told the Herald Sun, the priest told me it was the right thing to do. Then he prayed with me and asked in his prayer that anything in darkness be brought into the light. Blair and Michael were known to have disagreements. And when Michael and Patty took custody of Liz's daughters, Margaret and Martha, Blair was devastated. She was their aunt, their actual blood family. But it didn't matter. Liz and George's wills were clear. Michael Peterson was named as guardian to the girls. Blair spoke to a lawyer about trying to adopt the two girls, but it didn't pan out. When Michael moved from Germany to North Carolina, the girls spent a long summer with Margaret Blair in Rhode Island. Blair was heartbroken when Michael insisted they return with him to North Carolina. 
but she still insisted she wasn't holding a grudge. She told the Herald Sun, I let it go. I can't say that I had any resentment. And as I told you in the last episode, she had accepted that Liz and George felt closer to their friends in Germany after having lived there for so long, so she did come to understand and accept their decision. Fast forward 16 years, she called the Durham police. But if she really thought Michael had killed her sister, why didn't she raise the alarm when she died? I would guess because she believed the autopsy results and as there had been no investigation into foul play, she didn't suspect her sister was murdered. But it was an incredible coincidence that two women in Michael's life were found dead at the bottom of a staircase. I can see why she felt she had to say something, even if she had not suspected anything at the time of Liz's death. For the record, because it does seem too coincidental, and we true crime folk don't believe in coincidences, I decided to do some digging. According to a 2017 study done by the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, about 12,000 Americans die from falls down the stairs every year. But to get technical, Liz Ratliff didn't die from the fall. She died from a cerebral hemorrhage. The prosecution would later insist about the coincidence that lightning can't strike twice. Well, statistics might say otherwise. I was truly shocked at that number. If Michael Peterson is innocent, it is still a wild coincidence and a truly unfortunate one for him, as we will see. When David Rudolph found out about Liz Ratliff, you can see in the documentary that he is pissed. How could you not tell me, he says. It's simple. Michael knew that Liz died from a cerebral hemorrhage. It was the hemorrhage that made her fall down the stairs. It didn't seem relevant to him. And we can all collectively groan with Rudolph on this one, because I know if I was in Michael's shoes, it would be the first thing I would have told my lawyer. Do with that what you will. Just weeks after the news of Liz Ratliff's death hit the papers, Michael's trial date was also set. He would stand before a jury of his peers a year later in the summer of 2003. But before then, the prosecution insisted on exhuming Elizabeth Ratliff's body. They wanted to perform a second autopsy. And yet, they waited for months to actually exhume Ratliff. In April of 2003, almost a year after Margaret Blair notified the authorities about her sister's death, the prosecution finally got around to exhuming Liz's body. It was just two months before Michael's trial. They had the lead detective, Art Holland, and a hearse drive from North Carolina to Texas. They dug up Liz Ratliff's grave, put her coffin in the hearse, and trucked it back to Durham. If you're wondering if they could have conducted a second autopsy in Texas, saving taxpayers a lot of money and expediting the entire process, the answer is yes. Yes, they could have. It would also have been a neutral third-party medical examiner, which is what David Rudolph felt should have happened if they insisted on exhuming a woman whose death had already been ruled natural by German and American authorities. But prosecutors wanted their own medical experts to see Liz Ratliff's body, and Liz's body was re-examined by Dr. Radish and Dr. Gleckman. Just like Kathleen, the medical examiners found seven lacerations on Liz's head. For the record, they do not at all resemble the lacerations on Kathleen's head. But because there were seven lacerations, another coincidence with Kathleen, the state would make much of that. And come on, if he killed both women by striking them in the head, did he count the blows on Kathleen so they would match? That is just a ludicrous comparison to me. There was also a linear fracture at the base of Liz's skull, as well as bruising on her hand, wrist, face, and back. More consistent with a fall down the stairs, if you ask some people. But to the Durham folks, consistent with a beating. Also remember, Kathleen's skull wasn't fractured. Ultimately, the second autopsy determined that Liz Ratliff did not die of natural causes. According to Durham medical experts, Liz was the victim of a homicide, blunt force trauma to be specific, just like Kathleen. Even though she had been buried for about 18 years now, and only about a third of her brain tissue was even left after her original autopsy. Except Radish went even further this time, 
calling it a homicidal attack. That's not how autopsies are supposed to work. You check a box for manner of death. You can list cause of death as blunt force trauma, apparently even in exchange for exsanguination if you want to, but you're not supposed to draw a conclusion that way within the notes. To make matters worse, the judge ruled to unseal the Ratliff autopsy for the press just two weeks before jury selection, even though he refused to rule whether or not the Ratliff evidence would even be admitted at trial during a pretrial hearing. These rulings are blatantly contradictory. David Rudolph was outraged. He argued that he needed to know if the evidence was coming in so he could address it in his opening argument. But the judge refused to rule on that until the prosecution made a motion to enter the evidence. And the prosecution played coy, saying they were not sure they wanted to enter the Ratliff evidence yet. So then why exhume her? Margaret and Martha were devastated by this. As children, they had suffered nightmares about their dead parents. Years later, after Michael's trial, they said having their mother exhumed brought on new nightmares that the young women suffered for years. And they were forced to sign off on the exhumation. Liz's sister and mother gave permission, but it would ultimately be up to the girls. They felt if they said no, it would make their dad look guilty. It was a terrible position to put these girls in for a death that German and American authorities had ruled natural almost two decades before. You cannot see this as anything but prejudicial and tainting the jury pool. The prosecution had known for a year about Liz Ratliff. They had a year to exhume her body, but waited until a little over two months before trial. Then the autopsy results are released to the press two weeks before jury selection. Come on. But prosecutor Jim Harden blamed the media circus on Peterson's defense attorney, David Rudolph. Rudolph was notorious for working with the press, but in this case, he pretty much had to when the police, chief medical examiner, and the prosecution were leaking evidence against Michael to the press before the trial even started. Even though this case would go national, I think not asking for a change of venue was a major mistake on the part of the defense. Durham knew Michael Peterson, and now they were well aware of all of the salacious details, whether or not those details were even relevant. Despite how you feel about Michael Peterson, even if you think he is guilty, he deserved a fair trial. He was still supposed to be innocent until proven guilty but he was tried in the media before his actual trial even got started. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Join us next week for part three of Kathleen Peterson's case. We'll dive into the Peterson family's supposed money struggles, Michael's trial, his subsequent appeals, and popular culture's response to this controversial case. And of course, we will discuss the infamous owl theory, which is not as ludicrous as it sounds. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank and me. And of course, all editorial opinions are my own, but I cannot thank Andrea enough for her incredible research and writing. The Peterson case is one of the most complicated I've ever covered, and I could not do it without her. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the Listener Suggestion tab. This is the best way for me to get those little-known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming to me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fraud True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton and share memes. I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds. But it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit asses allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon and Audible. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.